Welcome to the Paranormal Mysteries Podcast, and thank you for being here. I am your host, Nick Ryan. Today's first listener story comes to us from Katri. Katri's story is called, My Paranormal Experiences. Katri says, Hi all, and greetings from Finland. Also, I want to thank you for your podcast. I've been listening to it for over a year now, and finally I had the courage to tell my stories. Bear with me, there's a lot. I'm originally from a small village in eastern Finland, near the Russian border. Our childhood home used to be a small two-bedroom house with a kitchen and a living room. It was built in the 1970s, and from what I know, the land used to belong to the neighbors, who later sold the land to the municipality, who then built a dozen houses, turning it into a suburb. In 1993 or 1994, my dad did some renovations in the house and built two more bedrooms, one sitting room with a fireplace, and a new bathroom with sauna. We three kids moved into the new part of the house, while our parents kept their old bedroom in the old part. This new part and the old part of the house was connected by one long hallway, which didn't have any windows at all, and during nighttime, there would be this one small nightlight in the middle of the hallway, just to show us kids some light if we had to use the bathroom at night. I was around six years old, my brother was eight, and my little sister was only four, but we all had this strange feeling about this new part of the house. It was hard to explain, but we never wanted to spend time there alone. My first encounter with paranormal, or strange things, happened only a few nights after we moved into the new part of the house. All three of us kids slept in the same bedroom, as no one wanted to sleep alone. Me and my big brother had this bunk bed. My brother was sleeping on the upper side of the bed, and me below him, while our little sister had her own bed on the other side of the room. The bunk bed was placed near the window, opposite the door, so that when sleeping, we could see the window, but also the doorway. And as well as us kids wanting to sleep together, we also wanted our parents to leave the door open during the night, so that we could see the fair light coming from the hallway. So this particular night, I was having a nightmare, where a white figure chased me in the yard. The nightmare was super vivid and realistic, so when I woke up in the middle of the night, I was sweaty and frightened, and I decided to go to my parents' bedroom to wake them up. But as soon as I had opened my eyes, I saw this pure white, almost shining like magnesium when burning, figure by my bedside, waving its hands approximately 20 centimeters above my stomach. It was human-shaped, but it didn't have any clothes or genitals, or anything human about it. Also, I didn't see its face. The figure was so tall that its head was above the bunk bed. As I told you before, I was around six years old, and what does a child do when encountering something scary? Of course, hide under the duvet. So I hid under the blanket, trying not to breathe, as I didn't want this creature to notice that I was awake. Also, I tried to pinch myself a few times to see if I was dreaming, and after every pinch, I looked under the blanket to see if the figure was still there. Needless to say, that it was. I don't know how long I kept doing this, pinching myself and then hiding underneath the duvet, trying to figure out what to do. I could hear my siblings still sleeping. I could see the light coming from the hallway, but I was too scared to yell for help as I was so afraid this figure would notice me and do something to me. The creature didn't move. The only thing it did was to move its hands above my stomach, almost like it was trying to pet me or comfort me. I have no idea what happened next. I remember being so scared that I could faint, so maybe I did, because the last thing I remember is that I woke up in the morning from my bed. As soon as I woke up, I remember running to tell my mom what I had seen, and of course, she and my siblings thought that I had just had a bad dream. They still do think that way, though now that I'm 33 years old, and I'm even more convinced that this figure was real, and it definitely wasn't a nightmare, a night terror, or sleep paralysis. What's even more interesting is that my mom is still sure that I came to sleep in their bed that night when I saw the figure, even though in my memory I woke up in our room. If my mom is right, 
then I have no idea how I got to my parents' bedroom that night, or why I'm sure that I slept the rest of the night in my own bed. After this encounter, I always felt that someone was watching me in our house. It was almost like I could feel a presence or something or someone, even when there wasn't anyone else in the house. The house started to make weird noises. The knives and forks would jump by themselves on the kitchen table. The radio or stereos would go on and off by themselves. The lights flickered. Even my brother encountered something weird in the house. He didn't tell me this until recently, though when he was a teenager sleeping in the other bedroom of the new part of the house, he woke up a few times during the night, only to realize that his whole bed was shaking uncontrollably. He was awake and he could move, but his bed was shaking and he was sure that aliens tried to kidnap him. Also, my mom has experienced something strange in those bedrooms. This happened only a few years ago. She was struggling to sleep in her own bedroom, so she went to our old bedroom in the new part of the house to try to get some sleep. It was winter and the windows were closed and she was laying on her back when suddenly she felt this cold breeze coming from somewhere. She couldn't make sense of where it came from, but as soon as this cold air hit her, she felt someone grab her chest and pull her up into a sitting position. She didn't see anyone or anything, but suddenly she was sitting in the bed. She told me she didn't feel scared at all, just confused, because someone or something had just forced her to get up. The newest thing that has happened to me in that house was in the autumn of 2018 when I was visiting my parents. Usually my husband comes along with me when I go to see my parents because I still don't like to sleep alone in that house. But this time, I went alone. It was a normal evening, nothing out of the ordinary. My parents went to bed early and I stayed awake a bit longer. I called my husband to say goodnight and I went to bed. But as soon as I turned the lights off, I started to feel restless. I felt hot, thirsty, and I couldn't get to sleep. I got really frustrated went to the bathroom, and then came back to bed. Immediately when I closed my eyes, I felt this sort of banging above my head. It was like someone was drumming and shaking my blanket, almost like teasing me not to sleep. I turned on the light immediately and looked around, but there was nothing there. It was almost 3 a.m., and I had not slept at all, and now someone was playing games with me. I still don't know what happened, but there was someone that someone who has always been there watching, teasing, and playing with stereos and lights, and now it had played with my duvet. I was scared, even though I was 31 years old. I didn't mind the flickering lights or weird noises in the house, but this was just too much. I couldn't sleep until 7 a.m. until I heard my parents waking up and making coffee in the kitchen. My next story is more like something to do with me. My husband calls it my sixth sense, and I guess he is right, even though I don't see dead people. To make sense of this, I have to go back into my childhood in the 1990s. Our family has a summer home in the countryside. This house was built in the 1950s by my grandfather. It was built on an area where thunderstorms would hit really hard during the summers. This day was a beautiful yet hot summer day in July 1995. A thunderstorm was about to crash and we had removed all the electric devices from the power sockets. I was eight years old, and our family was having a nice lunch of homemade pizza. My grandfather and I were the ones who finished their pizzas first, so we stepped out of the dining table to sit near the television on the other side of the room when the storm hit, and suddenly there was a loud bang, and the whole room was full of light. I remember someone screaming, my granddad freezing in shock, and there was smoke everywhere, but nothing was burning. A few seconds later, we realized that the lightning had hit the cabin and it had gone through the television. I remember my hair was standing up and I was crying. However, after this accident, I have often felt sick and suffered headaches hours before any thunderstorms. Also, I have started to feel the same nausea in different places. It was almost like I could feel energies in different levels than others. My brother, who is a physician, now often jokes how I became allergic to electricity after that accident in our past. Who knows, but whenever I have visited some old places, especially if there's been any kind of sad accidents, deaths, etc., 
I often feel like my energy is being sucked, like some kind of other force is making me feel sick to my stomach, and I often feel like panicking or throwing up. When I first moved away from home to live alone in another town in 2007, I had this one specific trail that I always loved to run. However, after a couple of kilometers on this trail, I often started to feel scared, sick, sad, or just cold, even if it was summer. Somehow, it always felt off. One day, I decided to Google if there was anything interesting about the place. To my surprise, that particular place was near a mass grave from 1918, when the Finnish Civil War had taken place. This incident blew my mind, and since then, I have searched and Googled every place that I have visited that has given me some weird feelings. With this sixth sense, I have found old witch-hunting places from the Middle Ages. I've sensed some spirits in old prisons, or I haven't felt welcomed in some places as well. I'm pretty sure that this sense has something to do with that lightning accident. They say that spirits are some sort of energy that is left here. So maybe, just maybe since that accident, I can now sense them. It's like I'm more sensitive to electricity than most. If you or anyone else have experienced something similar, it would be great to hear about it. Anyway, when it comes to other paranormal experiences, here is a few more. Since I was a child, I have been like a magnet to paranormal stuff. I have often felt that someone has been following me through the years and causing all sort of paranormal activity. In 2007, I left home and moved alone to a tiny apartment in a bigger town. At first, all was well, but little by little, strange things started to happen. The taps in the shower would open by themselves, and my phone would ring without anyone calling. But I didn't pay much attention to this, at least not until 2008, when I moved to Helsinki, the capital of Finland. There, I rented a tiny flat from an old lady. It turned out that she was theologian, and she had this weird collection of biblical CDs on her bookshelf. One day, me and my friend played one of the CDs, only to realize it wasn't any ordinary CD, but the old lady reading lines from Revelation. We were shocked, and quickly we turned off the CD. After that day, things started to get weird. The stereos would go on and off. The lights would flicker. The taps would open up and close by themselves. These events didn't scare me, though, as the same thing had happened before in my old flat. But then, these nightly scraping sounds started coming out of the walls. At first, I thought it was mice, but the strangest thing was that the sound didn't start until I had turned off all the lights in the evening, and as soon as I put the lights on, the scraping sound would stop. Also, it didn't sound like an animal at all. It sounded like human fingers scraping the wall. Needless to say, it freaked me out. But it wasn't until one night, when me and my boyfriend went to bed, and the scraping sound started again, and suddenly the lamp on my nightstand turned on and off, and made this loud bang noise like the glass was breaking, and we screamed in panic and ran to the kitchen. The scraping sound was really loud, and it felt like someone was coming out of the wall near the bed. While still shaking, we turned on the lights in the kitchen, and the scraping sound stopped. After that, we went to look at the lamp by the nightstand, and to our surprise, the light worked just fine. The bulb hadn't been broken, even though we were sure that it was. After that night, I moved out, and I never looked back. I still have no idea what was making that scraping sound, but it surely wasn't anything from this world. My next story is from 2014, when I had just met my husband, and I started to hang out a lot in his flat. He had a lovely black dog, who used to stay in the living room during the night. From the start, I often felt that something wasn't right in the apartment. It was a bit grim, and I didn't feel like spending time there alone. Then one night I woke up and went to the bathroom, and I froze. The black dog was playing with a tennis ball by himself, or that's what it looked like at first. I thought it was weird that she would play at this hour by herself, when suddenly the dog dropped the ball on the floor and looked straight to the corner of the room, waving her tail. 
The ball rolled towards the black corner, and to my surprise, it suddenly changed direction and came back to the dog. It looked like the dog was happily playing with someone. I turned back to the bedroom, and once inside, I saw my boyfriend standing beside the bed. I was relieved and went to hug him, only to realize there was no one there, and my boyfriend was still sleeping. I got really scared and woke up my boyfriend. I didn't sleep much that night. The next night, when I was trying to sleep, I felt someone sitting right next to me. My boyfriend was asleep on the other side of the bed, and I was the one facing the door. I sat up, but saw no one. Once again, I woke up my boyfriend and told him what I had felt. After these encounters for one and a half years, I often felt someone grabbing my ankle and trying to pull me out of bed. I started to be afraid of sleeping, as I didn't know what would happen during the next night. At the end of 2015, we finally moved to a new apartment, and since then, nothing has been following me or touching me while sleeping, and I hope it stays this way. The only thing that I have been suffering from the last few years has been night terrors, but that's another story. Thank you for your time, and feel free to share these stories or ask more questions. All the best, and good luck with your next episodes. Wishing you well, Katri. Our next listener story comes to us from Jerry. Jerry's story is called Green Man. Hi, I just found your podcast a few weeks ago and love it. Listening to some recent episodes sparked a few memories which I'd like to share. I'll send them each separately so as not to make this email too long. The first was from your Fay Folk episodes. About 2001, I was working for a client developing a high-end real estate property in North Scottsdale, Arizona. The property was out in the desert a bit, and when the archaeological survey was conducted, they found it had once been used as a seasonal camp for the Hohokam. Also near the property was a prehistoric astral observatory, something akin to Stonehenge, where ancient people could mark the seasons by keeping track of sunrise and star clusters. In speaking with the superintendent one day, he mentioned that some of his crew thought that the place was haunted. He said they had found an old doll, a modern one, not Hohokam, and it kept reappearing at different places on the job site. He said that he thought the guys were playing tricks on each other, but some of them didn't find it funny. He also said that late at night, you could hear people walking around when no one was there. So fast forward a bit, my client wanted to document the beauty of the desert before earth moving for roads and infrastructure disturbed it. He asked me to arrange for a photo, so I called Arizona Highways. Arizona Highways is an internationally known magazine, famous for the quality of its landscape photography. They referred me to a freelancer, and I hired him to do the job. He shot the images at sunrise and sunset on large format 4x4 film transparencies. I received the images and began reviewing them with my art director on a light box. The images were beautiful, but in one, there was a green blip in the foreground, about a third of the way up. I thought it was just a bit of construction debris the photographer had neglected to clean up before taking the shot, or a flaw in the film, but I wanted to be sure. So I grabbed a loop, a type of small magnifying glass to view film, and I looked at the spot. To my astonishment, as soon as I put my eye to the glass, I saw a small face staring back at me. But it wasn't just a face. It was a little figure with a leafy head, two black eyes, a bump of a nose, and a small, slightly open mouth. Not only that, but he appeared to have two leafy arms and two leafy legs, but his body was somewhat transparent, as if he was fading out. The creature looked to be running from left to right across the photograph. He looked as if he had been caught in mid-stride while glancing at the photographer. I had my creative director look at it, and she agreed that it looked like a little green man. Curious, I called the photographer and asked if he remembered anything being in the frame of this photograph. He said nothing was, and that he had cleaned the foreground before setting up. He asked the reason for my question, but I made an excuse and didn't tell him. Next, I thought I'd look online to see if I could find anything similar, hoping for an explanation. 
so I typed in green man. To my surprise, I found a nearly exact match, but it wasn't what I had expected. What I found were leafy images of green men, who were forest folk, from European folktales. I cannot tell you that we captured a fairy on film. Maybe it is just matrixing, or a weird defect in the image, but I have a copy of the image I will send to your Gmail account. The one I'm sending you is the classic blurry photo. Although the original image was crisp and clear with fine detail, we have lost the film after nearly 20 years. The image I can send is from a scan made of a print created back in 2001. It has then been enlarged several times to make the green man as easily visible as possible. I've never told this story before because I'm afraid people will think I'm a loon. I don't know what it is, but it's curious, to say the least. Our next story of the night comes from Jerry. Jerry's story is called B.E.K. Experience. Jerry says, Hi. Your recent episode on black-eyed kids' experiences sparked the memory of a story that my grandmother used to tell. In the early 1970s, my father was a reserve police officer in our small town. I was a baby, and my mother would often stay with my grandparents, her mom and dad, at night while my father was on patrol. One of these nights, I was asleep in a little bassinet in the living room. My mom and grandmother were sitting up late, talking, waiting for my dad to arrive and take everyone home. It was probably some time after midnight. In the middle of their conversation came a knock at the door. Thinking it was my father, my grandmother got up to answer while my mother gathered our things to go home. But when my grandmother opened the door, it wasn't my dad. She said it was a woman with honey-colored blonde hair and a fur coat of about the same shade. She said what stopped her, though, were the woman's eyes. She said they were the deepest green she had ever seen. Startled, my grandmother asked, Can I help you? She said the woman replied, Can I come in and sit by your fire? My grandmother said that just as the woman spoke, the strongest fear came over her. She was terrified. The only thing that came to mind was to shout, Hell no! And she slammed the door. Hearing this, my mother jumped up from where she was folding things on the couch to look out the front window next to the door. At the same time, my grandmother opened the door back up, not believing that she had behaved in such a way. But neither saw anyone, not in the yard and not in the street. My mother had heard the entire conversation. She knew the woman had been there, but when she jumped up, she was gone in a split second. My grandmother and mother walked out into the yard but there was no one, and there were no cars. My grandmother had a large fenced yard. It would have taken several seconds, even at a sprint, to reach the gate, and she lived a block off the main street in our town, on a road with no traffic. Surely, they would have heard or seen a car pulling away, or noticed someone walking down the street. The next day, she went to her neighbors to ask if they had had any late-night visitors, or if anyone had come to ask for help. They all said no. My grandmother was never superstitious, but this incident always caused her to pause, and she never much liked telling the story. Our next listener story comes to us from Kelsey. Kelsey's story is called Unwanted House Guest. Kelsey says, Hi, I just recently got into your show when looking for a podcast to get me back into the spooky season spirit. I have been binging it for the past week, and I decided to write in with one of my own stories. Thank you. I was 11 or 12 the first time I ever had an experience with something that I could not explain. My aunt and her family were moving into a new house, and they had finally gotten the keys and wanted to show my mom, me, and my two brothers. When you walked through the front door, you were immediately in the living room and could see directly through the kitchen and laundry room. We all huddled in the living room at first to chat and catch up. Because they had just gotten the keys, the place was empty. I found myself sitting on the floor, leaning my back against the wall. I was next to the front door, where I had a clear shot of the kitchen and laundry room. The rest of the family was hanging out in the center of the living room and were chatting. I noticed something move out of the corner of my eye, 
and when I looked, I could see a gray mass roll across the kitchen floor into the laundry room. The best way I could describe it is that it looked like a dust bunny the size of a basketball rolling across the floor. Without even thinking, I stood up and immediately walked through the kitchen and into the laundry area to investigate. It felt like I was drawn in. I did not consciously make the decision to walk over. You see, I was not particularly close to this aunt, and she had not given us the tour of her new home yet. I would never just walk through her house for the first time, because that would be impolite. But here I was, walking through her kitchen and into the laundry area, where I systematically looked from one side of the laundry room to the other. I found nothing. I began to walk back to my family, when halfway through the kitchen, I felt intense pain. My whole body felt like I was being stabbed by a blanket of needles, and my body went stiff. I was able to hurl my hands on the kitchen counter. I could not recall how long I was leaning there, trying to breathe through the pain. My mom eventually went looking for me and asked if I was okay. As she entered the kitchen, the pain had slightly subsided, enough for me to turn my head and tell my mother that I was not feeling well and wanted to go home. She could see that something was seriously wrong, and she had to help me walk to the car. It was not until we were a few blocks away that the pain stopped. I knew that whatever was in that house was evil. I only ever entered the home one more time to help my aunt move her things. The entire time I was stressed and felt complete terror that I would experience that pain again, or that something would pop out at me. I didn't see anything during that last visit, but the whole time I felt like I was being watched and was not welcome. Since that first experience, I have had many more encounters with the paranormal. For instance, I lived in a home that was haunted for several years. However, nothing was quite like this experience because this felt completely evil. Our next listener story also comes from Kelsey, and Kelsey says this, I was born and raised in California, but I moved to Texas with my family when I was 19 years old. There is a road about an hour from my parents' home in Texas called Bragg Road, known for the legend of the Saratoga Light. I will keep my explanation of this road brief, because it is not the most interesting part of my story. Anyway, Bragg Road is a country road outside of the city of Saratoga that is pitch black, no streetlights. However, a mysterious light has been seen on this road since the early 1900s. Anyways, my best friend from California was visiting, and my family wanted to take her to see the light because they were interested in some adventure. We piled into the car, my brother, mom, fiancé, best friend, and I. When we entered the road, we turned off our car lights. Locals suggest you turn off all your lights when driving on this road to see the Saratoga light, and avoid others mistaking your car lights as this phenomenon. However, driving at night without headlights can be dangerous, and I would not recommend it. My brother was driving down the road at about 5 to 10 miles per hour. We were probably halfway down the road when the light appeared behind us. It seemed far away at first, but got brighter, almost as if it was getting closer. The light would also change colors, from white, blue, green, and red. Once we got down the road, we left and went back home with excitement and adrenaline from this adventure. But the story gets weirder. The following evening, my best friend and I were watching Netflix in my parents' guest bedroom. It was getting late, probably about 1 a.m., and I went into the kitchen to get a drink of water. I felt like something was staring at me. As I looked to my left down the hallway, it was like there was static in the air. I could see the static moving toward me. I blinked, and then I could see a giant shadow figure at the end of the hallway, standing in front of the entrance of the bathroom. While the bathroom door was open, I could not see into it because the shadow figure was so dark. It was late, but the light from the kitchen and living room illuminated the hallway. The figure was humanoid, but had large, shadowy horns. The figure looked muscular, and from its feet to the tip of its horns, it stood about 9 to 10 feet tall. Its horns touched where the wall met the ceiling. I sort of stood there in shock, just staring with my glass of water in hand. After a few minutes, my friend came out of the guest room and asked what I was doing. I looked at her and then looked back towards the shadow, but the shadow was gone. 
I felt a slight panic go through me, and I told her that I was going to head home to my own apartment. She was going to stay with my parents, because it was getting late. I got into my car and drove home. During the entire 15-minute drive, I felt fearful. I would continuously check my back seat, expecting to see the shadow creature, because I could feel its negative presence with me, as if it was coming home with me. When I entered my complex, I parked my car and rushed to my apartment. This feeling of fear was unusual, because my apartment complex was gated, and I have always felt safe. However, tonight I could not rush to my apartment to lock the door fast enough. When I got home, I immediately locked the deadbolt. It was probably 1.30 a.m., and I had been home for two minutes, when I heard three loud pounds on my front door. My stomach was in my throat at this point. I didn't have the courage to look through the peephole. I ran to wake my fiancé, crying as I explained the situation. He opened the front door, but nothing was there. I did not get any sleep that night. Never had I heard such a disturbance at my complex, especially at that time of night, because a large majority of my neighbors were elderly. The complex was always quiet and calm. It was like the shadow figure wanted to let me know that while it couldn't enter my home, it could still torment me. Did my family bring something home with them from Bragg Road? Did I bring something from my recent trip to the antique market? I don't know, but I saged my whole place that next day, and I haven't seen that particular figure since. I know this sounds crazy, but I swear that everything I have stated was my true experience. Thanks for letting me share this. Our next listener story of the night comes to us from Rob. Rob's story is called My Psychic Girlfriend. Rob says, Hi Nick, here's a somewhat different kind of story for you. This story is different in that it unfolds over 30 years. It begins when I was a young single man in my mid-twenties, driving a red sports car and having a great time. One day, while at the laundromat, I met a gorgeous, friendly blonde woman named Stevie. We struck up a conversation, and right away I knew we'd be dating. Stevie was literally a playboy model, not the usual kind of girl that I dated, but we had a connection that grew even stronger when she revealed that she was psychic. Stevie was a psychometrist, which meant she could tell your past and future merely by holding a piece of jewelry in her hand. One night she noticed I was wearing a small gold medallion on a chain, and she grasped it, and that's when the fun started. Wow, she said, there's a lot going on around you. The first thing she said was that there were three spirits following me everywhere. A distinguished older European gentleman, a woman in her thirties, and a small little boy. None of them knew each other, but apparently they all knew me, and even guided me through business and social situations especially the man, who she described as in his sixties, well-dressed with salt and pepper hair. She said that he used a walking stick and was from the turn of the century. That would show up later in the story. Her second observation was making a zigzag motion with her finger in the air. Does that mean anything to you? she asked. Immediately I knew what it meant. The medallion I was wearing was given to me by my mother. It was given to her by her grandfather. I recognized the zigzag pattern as representing the medallion going from male to female to male over the generations. Stevie mentioned the medallion was indeed from the older European man, who she added was also a very lively, high-spirited person. When I asked my own mother about how she got the medallion, she said it was indeed given to her, but by her mother, who received it from her father to give to my mother. That's all she knew about her grandfather but she told me to ask my grandmother about him. I never gave my grandmother any hints when I asked her about her father. She literally described him as an older man with salt and pepper hair and a great sense of humor, always beautifully dressed and carrying a walking stick with him wherever he went. It was word for word Stevie's description. But Stevie wasn't finished. She asked me if the colors pink and green held any significance to me. I told her they meant nothing to me, to which she replied, Well, they're going to play a huge part in your life. When I told her I didn't know if I could have kids, 
because at the time there was cause for my concern. She replied, Oh no, you're very fertile. You'll have wonderful children, at least three. And I'll tell you something else. She smiled. You're going to be a lot wealthier than you think. Stevie told me other things that turned out to be true. In fact, everything she told me was 100% right. Eventually, we went our separate ways, and years later, I met the woman who would become my wife. One day after we'd gotten engaged, for no reason, I asked her what her favorite color was. Not colors, plural. Just her one favorite color. Pink and green, she answered, and indeed, that combination was her signature decor wherever she went. A few years later, we were married and ended up with, you guessed it, three kids. One boy and a set of twins. So it's not like we tried for three. We just got them. All of Stevie's predictions were indeed true, except for the one about me becoming wealthy. As the years passed, I found myself working harder, but sinking deeper into debt. One day I found myself deep in thought, wondering how after all those years, how Stevie could have been right about everything, but was so wrong about my financial mess. One minute after thinking about her, I had an epiphany about a business strategy that indeed took me from being broke to becoming worth millions. So Stevie kept her perfect record intact, even though it took more than 25 years to get them all right. Yes, I have tried to reconnect with Stevie after all these years to let her know, but she disappeared out of my life as quickly as she appeared. I know where she is, and I have reached out, but she has never responded. Like a spirit, she simply vanished. As we come to the end of tonight's episode, I want to say thank you to everyone for tuning in and supporting the podcast. And a special thank you goes out to Katri, Jerry, Kelsey, Jerry, and Rob for writing in and sharing their experience with all of us. If any of you have thoughts, advice, or a similar experience that you'd like to share with one of tonight's storytellers, you can email me and I'll be sure to forward your message on to them. If you've witnessed something unexplainable and you'd like to have your story shared on the podcast, please contact me at paranormalmysteriespodcast at gmail.com or visit paranormalmysteriespodcast.com and click on the Tell Your Story link. All of our contact information can be found in the show notes. Until next time, I hope you all have a great beginning to your week, and we'll see you back here on Wednesday with our next episode. From all of us at the Paranormal Mysteries Podcast, thank you for listening, and remember, don't wait for the unknown to come to you. Get out there and find it. <laughs>